Welcome to another episode of The Cubic Report. Well, sort of, because today I'm featuring a podcast by fellow podcaster Micah Gunn. He interviews Todd Nettleton, Chief of Media Relations for Voice of the Martyrs, who speaks about persecuted Christians, and I mean really persecuted Christians. I have been receiving the Voice of the Martyrs magazine for years, and have attended one of their general conferences in Indianapolis, Indiana. I admire them for their courage. Sometimes their courage costs them their life. It reminds me of what some Christians had to go through in biblical times to prove their faith. All across the world, and increasingly in Western nations, Christianity is facing heavy persecution. Voice of the Martyrs is an organization dedicated to assisting the persecuted in furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God in hostile nations. In this interview, Micah Gunn talks with Todd Nettleton about some of these persecuted people that he's come in contact with, the concept of persecution in general, and what our takeaways should be as Christians who aren't currently facing heavy persecution. While Christians persecuted in faraway nations might seem distant and disunified from us in Western civilization, it doesn't have to be that way. We all might have different beliefs and doctrine, but they can still provide excellent examples of standing up for your faith when it's difficult. This is a lesson that all who claim to follow Christ will need to learn as the world at large turns more and more hostile towards any sort of Christianity. The Voice of the Martyrs website is at www.persecution.com. I encourage you to listen to more podcasts from Micah Gunn on his podcast, which is Truth Be Told, the Truth Be Told podcast. You can see these program notes with the podcast for more contact information. So now here's Micah Gunn with Todd Nettleton. Hi there, and welcome to Truth Be Told. I appreciate you listening in. I am Micah Gunn, your host, and I'm joined by a very special guest today, Mr. Todd Nettleton, the Chief of Media Relations and Message Integration at Voice of the Martyrs, as well as host of the Voice of the Martyrs radio show. Hi there, Mr. Nettleton. How are you doing today? Thank you, Micah, for having me. I'm doing really well. Good. We are so glad that you could join us. I know uh, Voice of the Martyrs has a lot going on right now, and it's awesome you could take time out of your schedule to be with us here, and uh, I'm looking forward to this interview. I think it's going to be very beneficial to a lot of our listeners. I'm looking forward to it as well. So for our viewers who might not be as familiar with Voice of the Martyrs or um, just the organization itself or maybe what you do at the organization, could you give us a little bit of backstory on uh, where you work and what you do there? Sure. Voice of the Martyrs is a ministry to serve persecuted Christians. Uh, we are working in more than 70 nations where Christians are persecuted, helping uh, with what we call persecution response, basically helping directly alleviate the effects of persecution, uh, delivering Bibles to those nations, uh, and then what we call frontline ministry, which is really uh, equipping and helping and encouraging and training gospel workers in the places where Christians are persecuted for their faith. Yeah, you guys seem to have your hand in, in just about everything. Anywhere it comes to persecuted Christians around the world, Voice of the Martyrs seems to be there on the front lines of that. And that's just absolutely awesome. We love, I love the work that you guys do and all the content you put out is just so encouraging for me. That's why I wanted to have you on here today. Well, thank you. And my particular part of the ministry is, is in content creation. I'm the host of our podcast and radio show. Uh, I'm also our media spokesperson. So those are kind of my two roles. Uh, I get to tell the stories of persecuted Christians and tell the stories of God's faithfulness uh, in times of trouble and persecution. That's got to be such a blessing just to, I mean, from my point of view, just reading the magazine or going on your website and reading some of the stories, uh, it's encouraging and it's insightful for you on the front lines of that. I mean, you've traveled the world learning about people's stories that in persecuted nations where Christianity is forbidden or uh, just really condemned by a lot of people. Could you share maybe some of these stories that you've come across that have been personally impactful to you or uh, just kind of acquaint us with the idea of persecuted Christianity around the world? I think that's something that modern people are, are maybe not acquainted with as much as we need to be. 
Well, one of the stories that I like to tell comes from one of my early trips to China for Voice of the Martyrs. And, you know, I had I had heard about persecution. I had heard about what Chinese Christians go through. And so in my mind, I had kind of this picture of these really depressed, uh, downtrodden people. You know, they've been through all these trials. It, you know, it's great that I can come from America. I'll probably cheer them up because they're probably just so discouraged. And I'll never forget meeting Sister Tong. We, we went to interview Sister Tong shortly after, just a few weeks after she had gotten out of jail. And she had been six months in prison because she hosted a house church meeting at her home. And uh, so we went to sit down with Sister Tong and, and hear about her life and hear about her ministry and hear about the persecution. And I know I'm going to come back to America. I'm going to do interviews like this one. I'm going to, I'm going to tell Sister Tong's story. So if you're going to tell a story, you know, the first thing you need, you need the setting. Okay. So, so Sister Tong, you've just been six months in prison. Tell me about the prison. And what I'm thinking in my mind is, you know, how hard was the bed? How big were the rats? How terrible was the food? Uh, how cold was it in the wintertime? Uh, just, just let's paint a picture of how miserable a Chinese prison is. And so my translator translated the question and Sister Tong got what I can only call a heavenly smile on her face. And she said something in Chinese and my translator said, oh yes, that was a wonderful time. And I, I looked at the translator because I thought, you know, we clearly there's a disconnect here. He, right. it, some, something was lost in translation there. There's no way anybody would describe six months in a Chinese prison as a wonderful time. Uh, and, you know, are you sure you understood my question? Yes, I understood. Are you sure Sister Tong understood what I was asking? Her? Yes, she understood what you're asking about it. And what Sister Tong went on to say is during that six months that I was in prison, Jesus was so close to me. He was right there with me every single day that I was in prison. And she said, you know what else? There were some other ladies in my cell. And when I got there, they did not know Jesus. And I got to be the one to introduce them. And now they're following Christ. They're walking with Jesus today because I was in that cell with them. So Jesus was with me and he gave me a ministry to do. Why wouldn't that be a wonderful time? I mean, why, you know, what, what would be wrong? What would be depressing about that? And I got to say, and again, this is many years ago when I was, I was fresh at VOM, that really altered my whole mindset and my whole thinking about suffering, about persecution, about what it means to follow Christ. And so often when we get in a hard situation, our prayer is, Lord, get me out of this hard situation. Sister Tong's prayer was, Lord, how do you want to use me in this hard situation? <laughs> and I just think there's a lot that we can learn from our brothers and sisters like Sister Tong, who, who have that mindset. That's incredible. The absolute vision that she has to have to have that attitude. And you're right, there, there's so much to learn. And I think that's the reaction that I have, even when I hear some of the most uh, harrowing stories, you know, you, you hear of someone that uh, was stoned for their beliefs or was murdered for their beliefs and their families carrying on building churches in, in remote areas. And you think, wow, that's so difficult. But what do we really take away from that? And, you know, the Bible itself is full of stories of persecution or warnings about how to act during persecution that I think sometimes as uh, maybe first world country people, those of us in America, uh, we, we can sometimes read into these stories and say, wow, I should just feel so guilty because I don't experience that persecution, or I don't know that I would have the kind of faith that these people have. And instead of being encouraged and uplifted by the strength that is going on in these countries around the world, we can start to look inwardly again and say, oh, why, why am I not being persecuted like that? Or uh, is that a requirement for Christianity? Or maybe, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if the, I have the faith to go through something like that. Could you talk to our listeners about that for a little bit? Just the attitude that we should have when hearing stories like this? One thing I would say is just encourage people. God's not going to hold you accountable for someone else's challenges. Um, he's got challenges for you. And I think all of us would look around and say, hey, I've got challenges. Maybe we're not getting locked in jail yet. Maybe that's not our challenge. That's not the pathway we had walked. The other thing, though, I would say, and, and I love to share the story of Hanali Gronwald, whose family was martyred in Afghanistan, and her, so her husband and her two teenage children were killed by the Taliban 
in an attack on their home in Afghanistan. And I had the chance to interview Hanali and I asked her, Hanali, if I had told you a month before that attack that your family was going to be killed in a single day and that you were going to go on in your faith and, and still be strong in your faith, would you have thought that was possible? And she said, no way. There, I, I, I didn't have that much faith a month before that. I, I couldn't have done it. I would have told you there's no chance I would do that. And the comparison that she made, and I think it's something she may have borrowed from Corey Tinboom, she compared the faith to go through that experience to a boarding pass that you get to get on an airplane. And she said, you know, you don't get your boarding pass a year before your flight. <laughs> you don't get it a month before your flight. If I got it a month before, I would lose it by the time I was going to get on the plane. You get it when you go to the airport to get on the plane. And she said, God gave me the grace, even in the hours right before that attack happened. Somehow, some way, God prepared me and God strengthened me to be able to go through that. So for people like you and I, who we don't face persecution every day, the thing, the great comfort I take in that is if, if God is going to allow me to face persecution, God will give me the grace to go through that. God will give me the grace to stand strong in the midst of that. So I don't have to feel a sense of fear or intimidation, or I'm not as good a believer as those guys because I haven't been persecuted. I just need to do the things that God has placed in front of me today to do. And that's, that's where we're at. And if God, if God has a path of suffering for us, he will give us the boarding pass when, when we need it. That's such a, a better mindset, I think, just to realize that this isn't something that you can really even prepare for. Nobody can prepare for something like some of these people around the world are going through, but that God doesn't always require a prepared person. He, pre he requires a ready person, a person ready to answer a call, but not always someone that knows what's on the other end of that call. And that you're right. That is such a good mindset to have when considering these people. And I think it allows you to draw encouragement from them rather than this sense of shortcoming in your own faith. Let me push back for just a second, because sure. the one way that we can prepare is by saying, I will stand strong, but by making the decision ahead of time, you know, the Bible talks about counting the cost ahead of right. time. And so we can say, you know what, Jesus is the most important thing to me. And I don't care what else is going on. I don't care what other challenges come. He's still going to be the most important thing to me. So that part we can prepare, but like you say, the, the nuts and bolts of, okay, when they start shooting, what am I going to do? That's, that stuff is hard to prepare for, but that decision and that mindset that whatever it costs me, Jesus is worth it. That part we can grab a hold of even right now. Yeah, that, that's a great point. More like uh, Daniel and his friends purposing in their heart that they would be obedient to God rather than to Nebuchadnezzar and, and false gods. We can we can make those decisions today before we're even in the persecution situation. But uh, yeah, I guess I was speaking more logistically than yeah. <laughs> than spiritually. But I think also a reaction that people can have is that they can feel some sort of disunity from these people. You know, they're all the way on the other side of the world and they're going through things that are kind of foreign. I can't even put myself in that situation necessarily. And they feel this, this disunity towards these Christians in persecuted nations. You mentioned something in a speech you gave a while back about the Greek word uh, for martyr, martus. And you mentioned that it, it means witness rather than just one who, who dies for their faith, but rather one who gives their life for their faith. And I think that is such a unifying factor that we can pick up on right now. And, and we don't have to necessarily be shot at for our faith, but we can live every day for our faith. Can you comment on maybe some of the unification factor that this holds for us with other Christians that might be persecuted in other nations. This to me is one of the really great ministries that Voice of the Martyrs has is unifying the body of Christ and helping American Christians understand that even though you're not, you know, locked in jail like a pastor in China or your family doesn't kick you out of the house like a Muslim family in North Africa would do if you came to faith, that person that is going through that, they are your family member. Mm -hmm. They are your brother. They are your sister. And so understanding that unity, the other thing that, that Voice of the Martyrs does is help cross denominational lines. Because when, when it comes down to the people are being beaten if they stand for Christ, 
uh, at that point, nobody cares what church you go to. <laughs> they, they, they just care that you were willing to stand up even when there was danger, even when there was a threat, you were willing to say, absolutely, I'm a follower of Christ. No, I won't deny him. I won't back down. Uh, and so that that unity that crosses denominational lines, it crosses national boundaries, that is definitely a part of the Voice of the Martyrs ministry. And that unity is something we need to pursue now. Yeah, you guys you guys do such a good job at that, I think, of making me put myself in their situation, but also not, not to say, what would I do in this situation, but to bring the humanity out in people's stories. So it's not just a story of this many died in this place, but this man here did this thing. And it's almost like, you know, the person that went through that. And, and the point you made about on the other side of the line, where someone might be shooting at a Christian, that person doesn't care if that person is of this denomination or that denomination. <laughs> and so in that way, they unify us almost, you know, it's, it's not just about how do I have the right mindset to be unified with that person, but really when someone's being shot at or killed or tortured or persecuted for Christ, they would do the same to me if I were in the same situation. And that's unifying. They, they certainly would. That's true. And, and I love it that you say we help people to know and and some of that is simply because of the reach of our staff around the world and the fact that we do know, uh, we do know these brothers and sisters, or we know their church leadership that, that is kind of letting us know, hey, this pastor just got arrested. Uh, and, and so we can put a face and put a name because of the great work of our international staff that are in these countries on the ground uh, drinking tea with people and uh, and getting to know their names and hearing their stories uh, so that we can come home and, and like you say, put a, a real face and a real name to our persecuted family around the world. And I think another step towards unifying, if people would go to your website and look at the about section, there is uh, purposes in your guys's mission. And there's five things listed there. Um, I won't read all of them. I'll just summarize. I hope people go to your website though, because I looked at these as how does this apply to my life? You know, this is voice of the martyrs, uh, advocates for martyred people or people being persecuted for their faith. And I thought, okay, how can this apply to me? And literally every one of them is a direct application to my life. You want to encourage and empower Christians to fulfill the great commission. Now you mentioned in areas where they're persecuted for sharing the gospel, that might not be my area, but encourage and empower Christians to fulfill the great commission. That is a great commission to every single member of God's church, God's faithful, right? To preach the gospel and to prepare people. And when we take that uh, personally, and not just as, oh, an organization is doing that somewhere. I think this is really the key of what you guys do that is so special about your organization is not only bringing these people uh, that are being persecuted into a unified vision that we all have, where all of us are fighting towards the same end goal, but also showing us that goal and saying, here's what we're trying to help these people do. And then it makes me realize I need to be doing that. That's something I also need to be doing. I just think that's so great. You guys have that, five of them there. We do. We do have the five purposes. And uh, like you say, it is it is to equip people who are facing persecution for advancing the kingdom. But like you say, it's to inspire all of us to advance the kingdom too. Wherever we're at, God can use us as well. And so wanting to build that unity and wanting to build that inspiration is, is certainly a key. And it it comes straight from our founders. Richard and Sabina Wormbrand uh, were persecuted Christians. Richard was 14 years in prison in communist Romania. Sabina was three years in prison. So when they came to the West, they didn't just say, hey, there are pastors in prison. They said, hey, when I was in prison. I mean, they literally put a face to it. Um, and people all over the world said, okay, we know now we know about those pastors. We know about those Christians. How do we help them? That really is how Voice of the Martyrs was founded. And I liked earlier that you also mentioned uh, we're not persecuted yet because there is a growing animosity towards Christianity, not just in far reaching nations on the other side of the world, but in places like America and Europe and uh, who knows what's going to happen? You know, the Bible does not predict great things for the followers of Jesus Christ until <laughs> Jesus Christ actually comes. So we should be, you know, maybe seriously considering 
uh, these people's stories that are, are going through some horrendous things to say what might be coming our way someday. And I think that that points us to two things. It points us to the scriptures, uh, because as you say, the scriptures talk about persecution. They talk about what's going to happen. They talk about how we're supposed to respond. So, so we need to be doing that. But then the power of the stories of those who have already been persecuted it becomes more powerful. If, if this, the, the thing I like to use, and I'm a sports fan, so I, I love to use this analogy as a scouting report. If, if I'm going to play the New England Patriots next week, I want to watch the film of the team that beat them last week. If I'm going to be persecuted five years from now, I want to watch the film. I want to see the stories of the people who've already beaten persecution. They went through it and came out victoriously on the other side. That's really what the Voice of the Martyrs is providing every month in our magazine, every week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio, when we tell stories, is we're providing a scouting report for people who might be persecuted someday to say, okay, how do you go through persecution with a smile on your face? How do you forgive the people who are persecuting you? How do you keep a hold of your faith and even grow stronger in your faith in the midst of that? Let's look at the scouting report of those who have already done that. And let's see, how did they do it? So that if that day comes for us, we're prepared. Uh, how to forgive those who persecute you. Such a prevalent message in the Bible, and yet one that I don't know that I have mastered at all. But I, I can only imagine the stories that you must have about that topic alone. That is just, that's incredible. Is there anything you can share about that, actually, just quickly? It wasn't anything I well, planned to talk about. but You know, we are working on a feature film about our founders, Richard and Sabina Wormbrand, and the, the theme of the film is really forgiveness. And it shows Sabina, who, before she became a follower of Christ, she was born into a Jewish family. Her entire family died in the death camps of the Nazis. And yet the film shows her welcoming Nazi soldiers into her home and protecting them from the communists who were in the process of taking over Romania, cooking a meal for them, feeding them at her table. And the thing that has struck me about it is it shows that forgiveness is not just a mental process. It's not just like I think through this and then I decide, okay, I forgive you. But what Sabina lived out is, is she put feet to forgiveness. She, she loved, she had, she made dinner for the people who had killed her family. Wow. How, how do you do that? How do you get to that point? And it really grows out of, look at what God has forgiven me of. Look at how he has so graciously forgiven me. Now, in turn, I want to live that out. I want to demonstrate that to the people around me. And, but we see that again and again and again in our persecuted brothers and sisters, and it is one of the greatest testimonies to the reality of the gospel, because from a human perspective, it doesn't make any sense. You, there, there's not a, a class that you take that will help you do that. There's not a human explanation to make dinner for the people who killed your family. It only is, is, makes sense if Christ is real and if he has enabled you to do that. And so, you know, we see that even today, that act of forgiveness is such a powerful witness for the gospel. And you've even been speaking towards one of the questions I had, and that is, why should people care? And that sounds like a harsh, harsh question. But in reality, okay, someone's suffering on the other side of the world. But what's the takeaway for me? What's the takeaway for the average listener? And what you're talking about right now, you know, the example of Christ is how we can internalize and then act out forgiveness. And then the example of people like Sabina or like these persecuted Christians around the world can give us actual concrete, practical examples of people doing it and living it. And then we just follow that example as they follow Christ's example. And the more examples we have, the easier it is to kind of have boots on the ground, be practical about, you know, an actionable thing to do with forgiveness or uh, dealing with persecution and bearing it well, as First Peter 2 talks about. I just think that is just so important for everybody, whether you've experienced persecution or not, watching the examples of people who are going through it, uh, not to mention just the unification you can feel to people on the other side of the world. It's just absolutely amazing. And I, I just love the work you guys do. It's awesome. Let me add one more reason we should care is because sure. the Bible tells us to, right. uh, you know, Hebrews 13, three says, remember those in prison as if you were in prison with them. 
Uh, you know, if we were in prison, we'd want to know that somebody was praying for us. We'd want to know that somebody was making sure our kids had enough to eat. Um, you know, when it says, remember them in prison, that that's a scriptural command. Right. And we need to live that out. One that is probably overlooked far too often, I think. <laughs> often. <laughs> So then how should we respond aside from uh, this unproductive guilt that people can experience or aside from hearing the information and then saying, okay, great. I'll think about them sometimes, or I'll read the magazine. How do we, how do we practically respond? How do we practically help? Let me encourage our listeners to take a three-step process. And it's a pretty simple one. At least the first two are pretty simple. The third one might be complicated. <laughs> Number one is pray. And that's not me saying that. That's what persecuted Christians ask us to do is pray for them and not pray that they won't be persecuted or that they won't suffer anymore, but pray that they'll be faithful to Christ in spite of persecution, in spite of suffering. So number one, commit yourself to pray for our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. Then number two, educate yourself so that you can pray more effectively. Because it's easy to say, God bless persecuted Christians, but it's also easy not to say that. Uh, but when it becomes personal, when it is Pastor Wang Yi, who is serving a nine-year prison sentence in China, and his wife, Zhang Rong, and their son, Joshua, when it becomes personal because you know names and faces and places, then it's a lot easier to be more passionate in your prayers and to be more steady in your prayers. So number one, commit yourself to pray. And then number two, educate yourself so that you can pray more effectively. And Voice of the Martyrs has lots of tools to help with that. We send out a free magazine. Uh, we have a website called icommittopray.com where we will email you new prayer requests every single week. Uh, we even have an app for your phone that will pull up a new prayer request every day. So lots of resources. Number one, pray. Number two, educate yourself so that you can pray more effectively. And then number three, and this is where it gets complicated, whatever God lays on your heart to do, be obedient. Because as you're praying and as you're learning more, God's going to put his finger on something and say, hey, I want you to do this. And maybe this is write letters to Christians who are in prison. Maybe this is sponsor Bibles to be delivered into hostile and restricted nations. But maybe this is get on an airplane and go. And so you have to be kind of ready that, that God may lay something big on your heart. Uh, and then be ready to be obedient. But it starts out with just that commitment that I'm going to be a person who prays for my brothers and sisters who are suffering for Christ. Thank you so much. That That is, I love how actionable that was. Something concrete that we can, we can do every day, be purposeful about. And it's not, you know, so vague that people can't, you know, do that step, those three steps today, right now. And uh, I, I really hope people take that to heart, that it seems so simple prayer, something that can be taken for granted so easily, but it's also one of the most powerful tools we have because it's access to the most powerful being in the entire universe. So where can people find you guys? You've already mentioned Voice of the Martyrs, uh, more specifically your show. Um, any any plugs for anything we can, anybody can access you guys or get the resources you guys offer? Persecution.com is the main Voice of the Martyrs website, persecution.com. VOM radio is at VOM radio.net. Uh, and there's a way there's a link to all the different podcast services. You can put in your zip code and find a radio station that's carrying it locally. Uh, but I would love to have people connect at VOM radio.net. Uh, but most importantly is, is the main website persecution.com. And you guys also have the movie Sabina coming out very, very soon. I got tickets a couple of weeks ago, actually. It's it's playing in a fair amount of theaters, so I hope people it is will. more than 800 theaters around the country. There's a link on persecution.com, but also the, the website for that is sabinamovie.com, S-A-B-I-N-A movie.com. Um, and we are hoping for a lot of people to be impacted by Sabina's story. 